بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين نويت وتعلم وتعلم وتذكر وتذكر ونفع والانتفاع والإفادة والاستفادة والحث لا تمسك بكتاب لا وسنة رسوله ودعاء إلى الهدى ودلالة على الخير الدغاء وشيلاء ومردته من قلبه وثوابه سبحانه وتعالى ربي أشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم صلي على سيدنا محمد مفتاح باب رحمة الله عدد ما في علم الله صلاة وسلام دائمين بدوام مكلا وآل آله وصحبه ومن ولا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Good to see you all, alhamdulillah. Another rainy day in Seattle. I just flew in from the Bay Area, California, where it was very sunny. And it was sunny the whole time that we flew until right when we descended through a cloud into Seattle. <laughs> alhamdulillah. And uh, may the blessings of the rain descend for us, inshallah. And may the clouds that cover and veil our hearts from Allah be lifted, inshallah. So we're coming together again, alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah tonight to discuss the heart and particularly we're looking at Imam Ghazali's work, The Marvels of the Heart, as well as his Persian summary of that entitled The Alchemy of Happiness. And the first week we introduced the topic by di discussing Ghazali's life and summarizing that. And last week we launched into a summary of the levels of the nafs. We covered a lot of ground when we discussed the three main levels as well as additional levels that some of our scholars discuss. And inshallah, this week we hope to focus on the heart and particularly some of the analogies for the heart that Ghazali gives. And part of the reason we need to have analogies is because as we discussed last week, the heart is a great mystery and our true nature is unseen and our true nature is spiritual. And so this is something that often we need to speak about through metaphors and through imagery, which is why art and poetry um, is often the language uh, in which people communicate the most important aspects of human life, so things like love, things like uh, spiritual realities, and things of that nature. So, inshallah, also, as promised, we hope to look at this uh, model, which is a visual representation that was done by a dear friend of ours, Dr. Abdullah Rothman. And so, inshallah, we'll take some time to do that, but first I wanted to discuss some of these analogies from Imam Ghazali. So the first analogy is that of the heart king. And Imam Ghazali is illustrating to us that the heart in reality is the king and or the queen. And each one of us is a kingdom. So really this is an idea of divine governance of the human kingdom. That each one of us is a kingdom, in fact. And that the heart this spiritual nature, and here he, use, he uses heart really interchangeably with the spirit, is our true nature is placed in this body. And so the body is, is like our kingdom. And the Prophet ﷺ said that there is a piece of flesh in the body. If it is healthy, the entire body is healthy. And if it is corrupt, the entire body is corrupt. Is it not the heart? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Qur'an that that day in which wealth, neither wealth nor progeny will benefit someone except for those who return to Allah with a sound heart. And so, and there's many other verses and many other hadith, but if those were the only ones, that would be sufficient. In other words, all that matters in the next world is the state of our heart. And so our spirit came into this world and we have to traverse this world and make the journey of this life. But the whole purpose of life is to return to Allah with a sound heart. 
and qad aflaha man zakaha wa qad khaba man dasaha whoever does that is successful and whoever fails to do that loses loses so may Allah make us of those who are successful so the spirit comes into the bodily form and Ghazali and others will use the analogy of like a, a horse, right? A steed. So our body is the steed of our spirit. And we need our body. The body is not bad. The body is important. Just like if you're trying to travel through the desert, you need a riding beast to do it. And that's why in our tradition it's not permissible to harm your body right right just like you wouldn't starve your horse or you wouldn't fail to give it drink when it's thirsty or you wouldn't ride it day in and day out until it dropped dead that would be self-defeating likewise our body has rights over us right? our body has rights over us we have to sleep we have to eat we have to, you know, honor the natural needs of our body. And the body is a sacred vessel. It's a steed. However, and this is where this kind of gets into the drama of the human situation, is that the steed, you know, a horse, a wild horse, needs to be broken, needs to be mastered for you to be able to ride it. If it's not trained, you can't just ride a wild horse. It will buck you. And the nafs is like that. The self is like that. <laughs> right? And most people are being tossed from their horses left and right. And we all are. And so when it happens, we dust ourselves up and we try to train our nafs again. So the point here is that we have to travel from one end of this life to the next, and the body is the steed that Allah gave our spirit to do that. And, you know, others have made comments like, you are not, you don't have a spirit, you are a spirit. Right? You have a body. So this is like primarily just refocusing how we identify, as people say now. Now, Imam al-Ghazali then goes into the fact that the body comes with two central faculties this is really important and that is the irascible and the appetitive faculties so the appetitive right comes from the word appetite so just like a horse has an has appetites the body our physical body we are hayawan we are animals hayawan anatic we're the speaking animals we're spirit but we also have an animal nature we're composite and so our animal nature, it has appetites, needs to eat, needs to sleep, procreate, these type of things. And these are great blessings because if we didn't have an appetite, we would probably forget to eat and then we would waste away. If we didn't get thirsty, we would die. We would die right? And if we didn't get tired, we would destroy ourselves, in fact. Sleep is really important for well-being. And if we didn't have an urge to procreate, then the species would die out. Right? So these are not negative things. These are actually sacred appetites. Now, on the other hand, the irascible faculty is... Irascibility has to do with anger, actually. But in the broadest sense. In the sense, actually, of warding off harm. Just like an animal has an instinctual um, anger when it is threatened. Right? When, an when an animal is cornered or it's, it's young it, or cornered, you will see the animal um, you know, puff its chest up and attack or defend. Likewise, we, as part of our animal nature, we have this faculty, irascibility. And so Imam al-Ghazali is saying that at, at the basis, what these faculties are is that we have a desire to bring towards us what is beneficial and to ward off what is harmful. Right? And the key here is that those things are good in and of themselves. 
Right? You think of irascibility. We, te- we tend to think about anger as something bad. And this is a subtle point because the Prophet ﷺ said, when a man came to him, give me, and, and he said, Ya Rasulullah, give me some advice. He said, La taghdab. He said, don't, don't get angry. He said, okay, give me some more advice. He said, La taghdab, don't get angry. And he said again, some advice. He said, La taghdab, the third time. Don't get angry. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned for us that if we do get angry, if we feel anger, to sit down. And if that doesn't work, to lie down or to go make wudu. These are very effective because if you think of like the, again, like the kind of like animalistic urge, when someone's angry, what do they do? They get bigger. They puff their chest. They start to stand up, right? You know, they make themselves bigger. The Prophet says something saying like the opposite of that. De-escalate, sit down, lie down, right? And make wudu. But the key here is not that you shouldn't feel anger. It's that you shouldn't be mastered by anger. Anger itself is not bad. That's important. The Prophet ﷺ would become angry uh, from time to time, but never for himself. He would never become angry because someone insulted him or wronged him, ever, not once. But he would become angry when the rights of Allah were transgressed or the rights of others were transgressed. But he would never act in a way that was unbecoming of someone who is completely in self-control. That's the key, right? When people are angry, they make decisions, usually, that they regret. Right? In any case, and the Prophet ﷺ, when he would become angry, if you read the Shema'ah, there were certain signs. His, a vein would protrude between his eyes, his blessed eyes, sallallahu alayhi wa right? So he wouldn't necessarily show it any other way, but you would see this. So in any case, the feeling of anger is not bad. And in this sense of irascible faculty, it's actually the broadest sense of just um, defense. Right. So if you if a mother or any one of us saw a child running into the street after a ball and a car was coming, that desire to yell and to run, that's like that faculty is to ward off harm. Right. So that's a good urge. If you don't have that urge, there's something wrong with you. Right. No. So this is the point. So these are the two uh, faculties that come with being an embodied being. In addition to that, Ghazali mentions that we were given, the heart was given, various senses. So we were given sight, and given hearing, and given taste, and given touch, and smell. And all of these, Ghazali says, they're like the spies of the heart, so that the heart can gather information from this world. But then he also mentions we also have five cognitive senses, and he mentions common sense, imagination, reflection, recollection, and memory. And the purpose of all of these are to guide the irascible and appetitive faculty so that we can navigate this world, so we can traverse this world. Right? Because if you don't have sight or, or smell or hearing or your limbs, it's very difficult to gather provisions in this world. Nah. Now, then Al-Ghazali says that this sets up the creative tension in the human condition because in order to reach the purpose of existence, which is sa'ada, which is true happiness, bliss, nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to go on the journey, right? Yes, uh, last week we said the journey up the mountain to the Divine Presence. To go on that journey, you need your riding beast that will carry you. So you need these faculties of irascibility, and appetite. However, and this is what sets up the drama of the human condition, is that in a healthy person, spiritually healthy, the irascible and appetitive faculties are in perfect submission to the heart king. The king is the master, and they are the servants of the king. And they are mar- following the orders and marshalling the troops of all the bodily members and faculties. 
And Ghazali says, if this happens, the human being ascends to an angelic being, become a luminous being, Rabbani, someone who is in perfect surrender to the divine command. But then he says, the problem is, is that these faculties do not like to submit. And they do not always submit. In fact, they have a strong inclination to serve their own interests and fulfill their own desires unceasingly. Unceasingly. Now, then Al Ghazali mentions the aql, which is the word for the intellect. And this is a faculty that's related to the heart. But this is that faculty of reflection, of wisdom, of contemplation that is a sacred gift that we all have. And Ghazali says this is the faculty of knowledge, wisdom, and reflection. And he says it's the party of God. And the goal of the intellect, right, wisdom, is to be the advisor to the heart. So give, the heart is getting this wisdom from the intellect that is allowing it, the heart to dispense with the duties of the kingdom with great wisdom. And he said that because the fitra, our, our primordial nature, if we're guided towards righteousness, we will naturally incline towards it. However, if we're raised without righteousness, we will start to incline towards another direction. And so Ghazali says, if the heart does not use the army of knowledge, wisdom, and reflection to rein in and check the armies of appetence and irascibility, these armies will, by their very nature, be strengthened until they eventually overthrow the heart, imprisoning it and ruling the kingdom themselves. So this is what Ghazali is getting at, is it in a healthy person, a healthy spiritual person, the heart is the king and all of the limbs and all of the desires and one's anger and all of these faculties and then by extension our senses and our rational faculties are in submission to the heart and they are all working together to progress on the spiritual path. However, that is when someone is mastering their appetites and their anger. But the appetites, they're irrational themselves. So if they, don't, if they aren't mastered, they will then what? They will demand to be the master. If you do not master your appetites and your anger with the guidance brought by the prophets, they will master your heart and then the heart will actually become what he says, uh, imprisoned by desires and there's an overthrow in the kingdom and then who is sitting on the throne the heart is in the dungeon now and the appetites and anger start to rule the kingdom right and El Ghazali says quote this is the state of the majority of people for their intellects have been forced by their appetites to labor at devising stratagems to satisfy the appetites whereas appetence should be forced by their intellects to labor at that which the intellect needs. Now to help us kind of remember this in a real visceral way, Ghazali uh, gives us some symbols. And so we all have this heart, right, this spiritual nature. We all have this intellect, which allows us to be people of reflection, of wisdom, of insight, of knowledge. But then we have this appetitive and this irascible faculty. So these are kind of the faculties. Now, the appetitive faculty, Ghazali gives a symbol of an animal. What animal do you think is symbolizing the appetites? Anybody want to guess? What animal do you think? Wolf. What? Wolf. All right. For the appetites, anybody else? She said wolf. Anybody else? Huh? I think you said it. Hyena? Okay. Which animal? Pig. The pig. Pigs eat anything. Pigs will eat their own young. 
right? The mafia type people, they, they feed dead bodies to the pigs so they eat everything, even the bones. <laughs> this is a pig. So the pig is, is the embodiment of um, undiscerning appetites. And so Imam al-Ghazali says, each one of us have a pig inside of ourselves. <laughs> right? That's that appetite. Now, the irascible faculty, that, that uh, faculty of anger, you were right when you said wolf. He says that it is a wild dog or a wolf for the irascible. So the appetite, so you were wrong that it was appetite, but you were right that it was the other faculty, the irascible faculty. So we all have a wild dog or a wolf within us, right? And we all have a pig within us. So just so you know. You have those inside of you. But the good news is, we also have the intellect, and he says the intellect is represented by the sage. Right, so we all have the wise sage within us, right? That Gandalf type figure. We all have that within ourselves. And then he mentions that we all have also this pull or this faculty, this, this kind of quality that is demonic. Demonic. And he doesn't associate it with its own faculty, in fact. What he says, something interesting, he says that the demonic quality is the faculty of anger and appetence with the added power of discernment. In other words, it is the corruption of the intellectual faculty in the service of the irascible and appetitive faculties against the rightful master. In other words, right, so what the intellect is supposed to do is serve the heart a loyal advisor. But when the intellect becomes corrupted and it starts to serve the lower desires, then it is, advise, it is advising, you could say, the lower desires in how to trick people and how to harm people to get the desires. Right? So this is that, that faculty we all have as well. Then he says, that these qualities, the quality of the pig, the quality of the wolf, the quality of the sage, and the quality of the demon, that depending on how these influence the heart, ref result in the vices and the virtues. And then he said something amazing. And if you think about this, in each moment we're serving something. In each moment, we are serving some master. Some master is directing our actions or our words. And this is a quote that's really powerful I wanted to read to you. He says, The strange thing is that the believer disapproves of idolaters worshipping stones, whereas if the veil were removed and his true state were disclosed and his true condition set before him, as it is set before the Mukashifun, those who have kash, those who have unveiling, and we'll talk about that more next week. Either in sleep or when awake, he would see himself standing before a pig, now prostrating himself before him and kneeling, awaiting his signal and his command, so that whatever the pig is roused up to seek the satisfying of any of his appetites, the man is set forth at once to serve him, and to bring that for which he lusts. Right. And this is key because everyone is serving someone. And we mentioned last week that Allah says, Have you seen the one who took their hawa as their ilah, their fleeting desires as their deity? And so the extent to which we follow our desires, especially to the extent that they go against the divine command is the extent to which we're actually making sajda to that pig inside of ourselves. That's what he's saying, right? That's the reality. And if the veil were lifted, we'd see this, right? And we know, the Prophet said also on Yom al that you'll see people's true form, right? In other words, now that people inwardly, they could be dominated by that pig-like nature, that wolf-like nature, but they look like human beings outwardly. But in the next world, the veil is removed and people take on the form of their true spiritual nature. 
And some people will be manifested in that realm extremely hideous because of the state of their soul. May Allah protect us from that. The point here is that these qualities, whatever are manifesting in our heart, cause a constant stream of influences to reach the heart, which are either staining or purifying the heart. And so he's saying basically, if you're dominated by the appetites, certain qualities start to develop in your character. And he mentions shamelessness, wickedness, wastefulness, avarice, hypocrisy, defamation, wantonness, nonsense, greed, covetousness, flattery, envy, rancor, rejoicing at, at uh, other people's suffering, etc. And if uh, the wolf of irascibility becomes to dominate one, then that person becomes qualified by states such as guile, deceit, craftiness, cunning, deception, audacity, dissembling, violence, fraud, mischief, obscenity, and such. And then he says, and it's a longer quote, but it's so beautiful, I wanted to read it. If the matter is reversed and man overcomes all these, bringing them under the rule of the lordly element, that sagely element within him, then his heart becomes the abode of such lordly qualities as knowledge, wisdom, certainty, the comprehension of the real nature of things, the knowledge of matters as they really are, the subjugation of all by the power of knowledge and insight and worthiness to advance beyond all creatures because of the perfection and majesty of his knowledge. Then too he dispenses with the worship of appetence and anger and by holding in check the pig of appetence and returning him to his proper limits, he acquires such honorable qualities as chastity, contentment, quietness, abstemoniousness, godliness, piety, happiness, goodly aspect, modesty, sagacity, helpfulness, and such like. By holding in check the power of anger and conquering it and returning it to its proper limits, man attains to the qualities of courage, generosity, gallantry, self-control, patience, gentleness, endurance, par pardoning, steadfastness, nobility, valor, dignity, and others. Alhamdulillah. And then he mentions that this knowledge and this wisdom comes not through instruction and external channels, but through self-discipline and submission. So this is a real key that Imam Ghazali and many within our tradition talk about, this ilm al-laduni, that True knowledge comes through having taqwa, having God consciousness, and then aligning one's words and actions and states with what, with, with what Allah loves, and refraining from those urges to do that which is displeasing to Allah. And when we do that, we actually gain a type of knowledge, a type of insight, and a type of wisdom. Because as the Prophet ﷺ said, that Iman is a light that is cast into the heart. And if you see with the light of truth and the light of beauty, now you start to truly see. And this leads us to the second analogy that Imam al-Ghazali gives, which is that in addition to the heart being a king in relation to all the other faculties of the body, the heart is like a mirror in relationship to Allah, right? So the heart is like a king in relation to the body, but it should be like a mirror in relation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the heart, in fact, is created to reflect Allah's names and attributes. And the Prophet sallallahu said that Everything has a polish, and the polish of hearts is dhikrullah, remembrance of Allah. And so by remembering Allah and making dhikr, but making dhikr really is to act in accordance in each moment, in each breath with what Allah loves, we start to polish our heart, and then the light of the divine reality starts to shine within us more fully. Now, 
the question is, if Allah created our hearts to reflect His names and qualities, why are we not always reflecting His names and qualities? Right? Why does it seem to be the exception more than the rule? Right? We think of the prophets and the saintly ones, right? the Sahaba and those ones, but most people aren't like that. And the question is why? And Imam Ghazali is saying that praiseworthy characteristics, of course praiseworthy actions and words, right? you do righteous actions and righteous words, they purify the heart. And you do wrong actions and wrong speech, and it corrodes the heart or darkens the heart. But Ghazali, especially because in the second half of the day, he's focusing on the inner nature of the human being, he says that more subtly as well, that in fact, if we, even if we're not acting outwardly, our heart is being affected by whatever characteristic is dominant in our state. And we'll give some examples. So the point is that your heart in each moment is either being purified, right? the mirror is either being polished, or it's being corroded. There's never a moment where it's standing still. And that is even if you're sitting in your room alone. And he is really encouraging us to think of our intentions and our inner states and the things that we're contemplating as like inner acts, you could say. So we could use an example that's somewhat lighthearted but gets at this point. So say your neighbor pulls up in the driveway next to you with your dream car whatever that is, everyone has their own dream car. Now, some people, I know no one in this room, would feel a type of jealousy or envy, right? Because that's my dream car, and then they're pulling up right next to me, right? Now, obviously, if you were overcome by your jealousy and you you know, damaged their car, did something like this, that's obviously a sin, and that's obviously something that is harmful to your heart. But Imam al-Ghazali mentions that even if you don't do anything outwardly, how you respond internally deeply affects your heart. That's what he's really getting at. And so, for instance, if you feel this covetousness and you feel this jealousy and you feel, right, you think negative things about them, that is then clouding your heart, even if you don't do anything about it outwardly. Right? However, he says, if you check yourself, like if you feel a type of jealousy, but then you check yourself and say, Astaghfirullah, like, Alhamdulillah, I'm happy they have that. And may Allah increase them and more, and give me good too, but may Allah bless them, then that's an actual spiritual victory. Because you've now checked that impulse and you've polished your heart. And you start to, the point here too is, the more you do that type of checking that lower desire, the more light starts to fill your heart and it becomes easier for you. Right? And his point is that if you're in a state of greed or envy, like constantly, it's a constant clouding of your heart, a constant destruction of your heart, right? even if it's not manifesting on their limbs. Because a lot of times people won't act on their envy because it would have consequences in the world. Right? So that person might not destroy their neighbor's car because they don't want to go to jail or have to go to court or because that's not only do they have to pay for it but then it's embarrassing then everyone knows they're jealous right so they might stop they might not do it not for any internal spiritual reason but actually just for outward worldly reasons then it's still polluting their heart but if they stop themselves for a spiritual reason because they realize like that's not a good state to be in I should want good for this person then it starts to purify their heart no 
And the key here is that it's either a vicious cycle or a virtuous circle. Because like we mentioned last week, the parable of the two wolves fighting, right? In the Native American tradition, a wolf of light or a wolf of darkness. And the one that wins is the one that you feed more. It becomes stronger. So likewise, the more that we have self-discipline and that we have good intention and we will good for all beings and we are forgiving and we're giving, the more that becomes our dominant state. And the other pull towards the darkness becomes weaker and weaker. No. So, in that sense, Ghazali is really emphasizing that we have to consider the states that enter into our hearts as like internal acts. That if we're serious about the spiritual path, we're serious about following the Prophet ﷺ, we're not just guarding our limbs, but we're actually guarding our heart. And we're protecting our heart from the thoughts that come into it. And the thoughts that we entertain. Now that brings up a question because you might say on a certain level you can't choose what thoughts you have. And that's true. And Ghazali talks about that. <laughs> he, he, mashallah, left no stone unturned. And so in Arabic these kind of thoughts or they're usually called, you could translate as like promptings that come, involuntary suggestions you could say, that come into your mind. They're called khawatir. Khawatir. And he separates it into four stages, right? So this is real subtle awareness of yourself. You get an involuntary suggestion, something that comes across your heart. Then the second step is a natural inclination, meaning some things you you actually incline towards and others you don't. Then the third is a conviction, and this is the crucial point of control. And the fourth is a decision to act. So for instance, we give an example. Say there's something that it's impermissible to look at. If, a, if someone gets a suggestion, look at that. Ghazali says, at this point, there's no fault and there's no effect on their heart just for having that thought. Then if they have a natural inclination, right? Their appetite says, I want to look at that. Still, Ghazali says, that has no effect on your heart because that's your natural inclination that you can't control. But then, this, like the crucial point is that intention, what he calls conviction, where you're like, I'm going to look at that. <laughs> That's where it all switches. Because now, it's, not, it's like a suggestion came, look at that. You have the desire to look at it. But then it changes when you actually accept essential that prompting. You're, there's an accepting. Before you even do it, you start to you say, okay, I'm going to do that. And then the fourth one is the actual decision to act. And the carrying through with the action. And Ghazali points out here that if you do that, right, you carry through with that prompting, it strengthens that characteristic so that it becomes more difficult to resist in the future. Eventually becoming the dominant disposition. Whereas if that individual to resist the suggestion, the capacity for say chastity in this example, would develop and continually purify the heart. So this is really important because it's also merciful. And we might get thoughts, right, that, we're, that even disturb us. Like, why did that thought come in my mind, right? But this is just, you know, these type of thoughts come. They're promptings from shaitan. Just say, A'udhu Billah. And... and don't be affected by it, right? Don't think, oh my God, there's something wrong with me. Nah. Right? There's promptings that come from different levels, and we'll talk about it in a second. But basically, the scholars say that the promptings come from four levels. They come from Allah. Or they come from the angels. Or they come from your nafs. Or they come from shaitan. Each 
prompting comes from one of those four things. And there's ways, and maybe we can get into it in future weeks, how to realize what it is. How to realize what's what and where it's coming from. But Ghazali, as a general principle, says the way to overcome insinuations that co come from the lower self or come from Iblis is through three things. The first one is to increase in acts of ibadah, of worship, as well as the ascetic practices that break the desires, especially fasting. That's what he says, right? And we know this, right? Fasting weakens the pull of the animal desires. And the more you increase in worship, the more that those promptings of light start to come to you. The angelic promptings and the divine promptings start to come to you. And then the second thing he said is constant dhikr, constant remembrance. Just always be saying, La ilaha illallah, subhanallah, alhamdulillah. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Simple dhikr, constantly. And he says because when dhikr takes root in the heart, insinuations vanish. Right? If Iblis tries to come and he finds that the heart is already full of remembrance, he can't get in. Right? No. And there are people that are in constant state of remembrance. Even one of the teacher of our teachers, Sheikh Mu'abbat al-Hajj from Mauritania, one of the great sages of the previous generation, a generation of Ahamu, that those who were with him, they said that, that, that it, he was making dhikr in every single moment. Even when he was sleeping, they would hear him making dhikr. In his sleep. That was just his constant state. There are people like this. No. That every cell of your body starts to make dhikr. And you become someone who is just pure remembrance. May we be like this. Of course, how can the lower promptings come if that's your state? Right. And then the third um, discipline that Ghazali suggests is fikr, right? So, which means contemplation or reflection. And this is a beautiful quality. It's not just about fikr all the time, but it's also being contemplative and thinking and, and reflecting on yourself and your actions and getting a type of self-awareness and studying such as you're doing in classes like this where you gain more knowledge. Because, and this is one thing that Ghazali says, if you want to strengthen that wise advisor, the intellect, how do you strengthen your intellect? He said by studying wisdom, by studying the Qur'an, by studying the traditions of the Prophet ﷺ and the books of the scholars. Because knowledge then will empower you that when you have lower promptings, you're able to fend them off, you're able to fight them off. And this again, it's important to understand like we are on the battlefield of the self. This is the greater jihad. And we, we should be chivalrous. We should be knights, right? That we should see that each day of our life, in each moment of our life, that we are warriors in the most sacred sense. We're warriors of light on the battlefield of ourselves. And we're gonna lose sometimes. We're gonna be vanquished, right? We get overcome by ourselves. But we wipe ourselves back up and we Engage the enemy again. No. And we mentioned last week that um, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned this hadith in which he said every single person has a shaitan assigned to them, essentially. And they said, even you, Ya Rasulullah. And he said, yes, but mine has become Muslim. Aslama. It's beautiful. In Arabic, when you say... I became Muslim, you say, Aslamtu. I surrendered. <laughs> I surrendered. Right? No, no, no fights about convert or revert. Right? We should say it like that, I surrendered. I submitted. <laughs> but the point is that, and Ghazali says that, since the door that shaitan enters the heart through are the faculties of appetite and anger, and since the Prophet ﷺ had overcome his desires and completely aligned his faculties with the divine command, it follows that his shaitan, who at root works only through appetence, has no power and could not submit. There's a door, the, the only doors that shaitan can enter are through appetites and anger. So if you shut those doors, he can't do anything. Now. 
So this is really important because everything should be about protecting our heart. Our utmost concern should be about protecting our heart and protecting our heart from every thought that is unbecoming of a true servant of Allah and guarding those things that we contemplate and those intentions that we hold such that our intention in everything and in every moment and in every action and in every moment of stillness is the divine pleasure. And the more that we do that, the more it will become our dominant state, inshallah. Now, as promised, I wanted to say a little bit about this model. And, of course, the first thing I wanted to say about this is that this is just a visual representation, and it's done by our brother, Dr. Abdullah Rothman. But, of course, we all know that the ruh, the spirit, is not physical. So this is just helpful as a way to reflect upon it. Now, we've covered a lot of these terms here. So, of course, it starts at the top with Allah, the divine reality. وَنَفَقْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِ And Allah blew His spirit, the ruh, into each one of us. And this ruh is our true nature. And that's why He also has this general kind of field of the fitrah. And if you see the whole blue area, it corresponds to the nafs al mutmainna the self at peace, which we talked about last week, that higher self, which is in pure submission. That is the self, that is the illumined self, the spiritual self. And then the word munjiat, it means the saving virtues. And we're going to talk about that more in future weeks. But basically, these are the qualities that Ghazali is talking about. Of generosity, of forbearance, of patience, of self-control, of love, of contentment, of wishing good for people, of gratitude, of patience. All of these qualities, when these become your dominant state, not just fleeting passing state, but they're actually the, the abiding qualities of your soul, those are the natural qualities of your higher self and of the spirit and of that self at peace. Then if you go to the kind of intermediary level, the purple um, as it's represented here, you have the qalb and the aql. And it's interesting how he's shown arrows that can go up towards the ruh or down towards the nafs. And that's because the qalb, even the root of qalb is that which turns. And the qalb can either turn towards the spirit or it can turn towards the nafs. And the heart, if it turns towards the spirit, which is, and it becomes one with the spirit, and it becomes purify, purified, you could think of it, if we talk about the mirror analogy, then the light of the spirit just passes through the heart and illuminates your very being. However, if the heart uh, turns towards the nafs, and that means that the nafs itself becomes your dominant pull, your lower self, there is like a, it's almost like a smoke, and that's what Ghazali makes the analogy of. There's a smoke that rises from the pull of your lower desires that corrodes the, the heart, so it becomes darkened, right? Just like uh, if you have a, a candle and you have the glass, the lamp around it, it can become covered with the smoke. And then it will, uh, you can still kind of see the light through it, but it's darkened like that. And the aql also is this faculty of wisdom and contemplation and knowledge, and it should be guiding the heart, and then it becomes uh, spiritual, it's true nature. But as Ghazali mentioned, the aql can be corrupted by the lower desires, by the nafs, such that the aql then, the intellect and the rational faculty starts to be used in service of the lower desires to justify your bad behavior, right? We know all these um, excuses we can make for our own bad behavior. Now, 
if we look at the nafs in purple, nafs al-lawama, we mentioned last week, that's that conscience level where Allah swears by yawm al-qiyamah and swears by nafs al-lawama. So this is that self which is engaging and trying to remind us and striving to elevate to the higher level. And then tahdib al-akhlaq, this is... Uh, you know, trying to attain good character and to inculcate good character, righteous qualities. So this is kind of the intermediate domain. Then we go to the lowest domain, which is represented in red here. And the lowest level of the nafs, as we discussed last week, is the nafs al-amara bisu, the nafs that commands to evil. And you see the sphere it's in is ghafla, heedlessness, forgetfulness, being lost and trapped in the world of forgetting our true nature and our true purpose. And the word muhlikat means the destroying vices. So these are the qualities that Ghazali talks about resulting from the pig and the wolf, right? Greed, envy, jealousy, right? Hatred of others, rancor, wishing ill for others. Those qualities of darkness that are part of that lower self. And then, of course, shaitan and the dunya, that lowest pull. And those arrows, when it comes to the nafs, the jihad in nafs is that greater jihad. The jihad to transform ourselves from being dominated by qualities of egocentrism to having qualities of, of selflessness and light and prophetic qualities until it becomes taskiyah to nafs, which is the purification of the nafs. And we start to have that illuminated self, the nafs al-mudma'inna, which is purely in submission to the divine command. And you see the same uh, words on the other side as well. So that's a visual representation. And of course, we shouldn't get too caught up on the actual you know, visual representation because it's just a model to help us kind of think about these things, but I think it's helpful. And it's done by our brother, Dr. Abdullah Rothman, who teaches um, at Wasat in our heart-centric course every month, alhamdulillah. So, um, in summary, before we open for questions, we ask Allah to help us to purify our hearts. The whole thing is about the heart. Nothing matters but that. But of course, what we do with our limbs and what we do with our eyes and what we do with our bodies affects our heart. And of course, our heart directs our bodies. So it's not separate. How we behave and how we engage in this world will have a deep impact on our heart. And... The Prophet ﷺ said in an amazing hadith, if the light in the heart of the disobedient servant was to be unveiled, it will blind the heavens and the earth. And one of the great poets, Sheikh Muhammad ibn al-Habib, he said, if you knew of the bliss and the joy that exists in your own heart, you would weep tears of joy incessantly. And this is the goal that Imam al-Ghazali is talking about. How do we uncover that which is within ourselves? And the truth is, is that this is a priceless jewel and gem. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I was a hidden treasure that loved to be known. And the truth is, is that the human being was the qibla of the angels. Why? Because our ability to know. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I have only created the men and the jinn, the yani mankind, humankind and the jinn to worship me. Liya'budun. And Ibn Abbas, the Sahaba, radiallahu an, who is the greatest of the Quran commentators amongst them, he said, his commentary that liya'budun means liya'rifun. To worship means to know. To know Allah. Allah created us to know Him. And everything knows Allah in its own way. Every animal, every plant, every mineral, everything 
However, the human being, unique amongst creation, has the ability to know Allah. To the extent, to the supreme extent for a created being. Even surpassing the angels. This is what it means to be Bani Adam. Because Allah commanded the angels to bow to your father Adam. And you were there in his loins. Allah was commanding the angels to bow to each one of you. And when the greatest of the angels, Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam, took our beloved Prophet وسلم, by the hand up through the seven heavens and into the divine presence on the Isra wa Mi'raj, he reached the level Siddharat al Muntaha, where he told the Prophet, وسلم, I am not allowed to go any further. You have to go the rest of the way alone. And the Prophet ﷺ ascended into the Divine Presence, Qabba Qawsayn Aw Adna, two bows lengths or nearer. And words cannot enter into that realm of experiencing. But the point here is that the greatest angel had a maqam, and the greatest human ﷺ had a maqam. And so this is who we are. This is our birthright. Is to uncover the lost heart that is within each one of us. And, excuse me, one sister who had come to some of the classes, she mentioned, she said, a lot of the sheikhs that she had heard previously giving talks or khutbahs, they're saying how terrible we are, how sinful we are, how <laughs> wretched we are, how damned we are. You know, That's a common topic in khutbahs, right? But she said, what, what is beautiful about these works is that they remind us how great we are, actually. And how much potential we have. And how precious we are, actually. We have the most precious thing in all of creation, within our hearts. There is nothing, no gem, no precious stone that is more precious than the human heart. Allah said, the heavens and the earth cannot contain me, but the heart of my believing servant can contain me. La ilaha illallah. This is what you have inside of yourself. You have that which Allah created to know Him. Qalba mu'min arsha rahman. The heart of the mu'min, of the believer, is the throne of the All-Merciful. There's a great mystery that each one of us possesses. And this is the reason that the believer honors each person that they interact with because they see this is a person who Allah created and put a heart in them. And we talk about wilaya, right? Wilaya means sainthood, really. It means to be near God, a friend of God, the awliya. Allah talks about his awliya in the Quran. May we be amongst them. But there's the khas and the na'am. There's the general awliya, and then there's the <laughs> elect, the elite of the awliya. And the general awliya is anyone who has iman. That if Allah put iman in your heart, you are one of his awliya. Inshallah, we're all one of his awliya. And this is a great honor. And Allah has honored us with the greatest honor that he could honor any creature, and that is to have the light of La ilaha illallah, Muhammadun Rasulullah, within their heart. And so, may we devote ourselves to this path and be sincere with Allah and sincere in following the Prophet Wasallam, such that we are polishing our hearts in every moment. And our hearts are drawing nearer to Allah in every moment. And one of them said, if the kings and the rulers and the commanders of armies knew about 
the sweetness that we experienced alone with our Lord in the depths of the night, they would send their armies to try to fight us for it. This is the truth. Nothing in this world will ultimately satisfy us because our hearts are not from this world. Our hearts are from the Divine Presence. So may Allah forgive us and may Allah illuminate us and make us a community of light and make us people of hearts, true possessors of hearts who awaken to our true nature. Ameen. Ameen. Anybody have any questions? or thoughts or reflections before we close. Yes? Well, there is a question that came in online. Um, it is asking, uh, without an external teacher with whom to reflect, what are ways in which one can balance the inner voice of self-reproach to the point of despair? and the inner voice of self-compassion? MashaAllah. That's a good question. Imam Ghazali says that the best thing you can do is to have a true shaykh who can guide you because someone who's been up to the mountain and come back, they can see into you in ways that you can't see into yourself. They can discern in you things you need to work on and they can support your journey. And by the way, the true inheritors of the Prophet the true Shiu, they're always compassionate people. They're not judgmental. They see us in our states of like weakness. The way that a compassionate doctor looks at a sick person, they don't look at you like you pitiful. <laughs> That's anyone like this, they're far from the prophetic way. They look at you with the eye of love. And they see in you that heart, even if you can't see it. And they see like it's clouded now, but they have the pure spirit in them. And so they just do their best to support you to help purify it. But those people are rare. And even Ghazali said in his time, 900 years ago, those people are exceedingly rare. He says, so if you can't sit with someone like that, the second best thing you can do is be around sincere companions on the path. Sincere brothers and sisters who are also trying to work on themselves. And we all know this, that the company you keep is really important. Alhamdulillah, we're in good company. So that's one thing I would say in, in answering, is to seek out people that um, are also working on themselves because they will support you on your journey and uh, you'll support each other. As far as being compassion, self-compassion, this is something to balance and this is why it's similar to what they say, the believer flies with the wing of hope and the wing of fear. Because if, you know, hope is, you have to have hope in Allah and his, that He's guiding you. But you also don't want to be so like hopeful that you, Alhamdulillah, everything I do, Allah forgave it. I do whatever I want. You know what I mean? That's not healthy either. That's why a healthy state of fear is to know like, no, there are high stakes. Everything is being recorded. This is a lofty and weighty uh, affair. But... The key is not to rely on yourself and your own actions, but to rely on Allah's mercy. And to know that nothing you do is greater than Allah's mercy. So we don't trust in ourselves or our actions, we trust in Allah's mercy. And Imam Ibn Atta'illah Iskandari said in one of his hikam, he said, it is better for you that you do a wrong action that makes you feel humble than that you do a right action that causes you to see yourself. <laughs> In other words, like, I did that. Have a s type of self-righteousness. And many a people who did wrong action, that has actually been their means to make great toba and transform. And there are those that have done good things, 
but that was their means to fall because it caused them to be arrogant. And we know that none of us will pray more than, Shaitan, than Iblis. Iblis prayed for thousands of years, but his fall was arrogance. And there are those that their ibadah is actually not that much. And this is the last thing I'll say to this, is love. Because a man came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Ya Rasulullah, I don't do... Uh, no, actually he asked, he said, When is Yawm Al-Qiyamah? And the Prophet ﷺ very prophetically answered, What have you prepared for it? <laughs> and he said, I have not prepared much by way of prayer and fasting, but I love Allah and His Messenger. Like, that's all I really got. And the Prophet ﷺ said, you will be with who you love. You will be with who you love. And they say that the Sahaba were never more joyous than when they heard that. There's even narration that Abu Bakr went into ecstasy and started whirling. Because they doubted their act, but they did not doubt their love of Allah and His Messenger ﷺ. And love makes everything easier. Because it's hard to wake up for Fajr. It's hard to fast. Just because you know you have to. Just rules, right? But when you love. Who wouldn't love to wake up to be with their beloved? Who wouldn't love to not eat if they get to break their fast with their beloved? And so really the people that progress in this way, the fastest way, is love. May Allah make us people of love, inshallah. Anybody else? Um, earlier you mentioned um, um, like passing thoughts, but you also mentioned that we also have appetite. So how do you know what's an appetite and what's a passing thought? Um, often they're related, the appetites and the passing thoughts. So we will have promptings relating to our appetites that will come, right? The, the promptings are like the individual manifestation of that, right? You could say, yeah, yeah. And they say about the, like how to tell if it's from your nafs or iblis, or shaitan, is that the nafs is very like, it's not creative. The nafs is just like, it'll try to grind you down. And it'll be like, eat, 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 sleep, sleep, sleep. Procreate, 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 right? It's just like that. It just keeps. But at least he'll come with something. He'll be like, eat. Okay, you know, okay, okay, well, how about this? Do this. No, not that. Okay, let me try something else. Like, he'll just keep trying things. But the nafs, it's the same few things. The appetites are just a few, but they, they are incessant. So, nah. And the best way to overcome them is to... Fulfill them in a way that is permissible, and then, um, you know, discipline them slowly. Increase in fasting, incre increase in silence, increase in solitude, right? these type of things. And then the more you resist those urges, the weaker they become, actually. Whereas the more you f feed into them, the stronger they become. Anybody else have any thoughts, reflections, questions? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. I think my question is related to that. Um, is it better to sort of ignore the passing thought and hope that it just goes away and comes back two hours later? Or is it better to acknowledge and to check it in the moment? MashaAllah. I think it might depend, and maybe if you wanted to give an example, I, we could think about it. But I think in general, 
a good thing. You know, for instance, we all have those people that we feel a way about, all right? I know none of you have anyone you feel a way about, huh? <laughs> we all have people that we feel a way, and when we think of them, we have difficult thoughts or negative thoughts, right? Now, in a certain level, on one level, that's almost unavoidable. But the thing is like, okay, you think of this person and you feel a way about them and you start to have like negative thoughts about them is to, re is to be aware of that. First of all, it's just to be aware. Because a lot of times, right, our thoughts go places and we didn't even, like 20 minutes passed, we didn't even realize, right? So one is just self-awareness. And then it's like, you know, one of the suggestions is just make du'a for that person. Allah bless them. Allah forgive them. Forgive me, forgive them. And then, like, let it go with that. You see, like, so it's kind of like checking it in a certain sense. Um, so that's a good way. It's like, but you also, yeah, you don't want to, like, obsess over it. Like, you have a negative thought. And it's like, oh, my God, what does it mean? Oh, my God, what? No, just say, A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim and cast it out and focus on the good. You know, one of them said, uh, a sheikh asked his student, he said, who is better? The one who said, I'm so wonderful, I'm so great, I'm so righteous, I'm so pious. Or the one who said, I'm so weak, I'm so in need, I'm so mesquine, I'm so, right? And the student said, definitely the one who said he's so terrible, he's better because he's being humble, right? And the sheikh said, no, they're both the same. They just keep saying, I, I. Just say Allah. Like, get over yourself. So I think that's also a helpful thing to think about, you know. Is just to redirect it to Allah, you know. Shaitan runs away when you start thinking about Allah. He's like, oh. <laughs> Shaitan's weak, you know. He only has power over those that allow him to have power. But he's, he's weak. No. May Allah protect us from him. Mm -hmm. And as the Prophet said, shaitan flows through the veins of the children of Adam like blood. We all have these impulses, but the more that we follow the light and we have qualities of light and goodness, the more the light comes our predominant state. Inshallah. Zakhallah khair, and inshallah we'll close. Ila hadarat al-Rabi al-Fatiha. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. Amin. Zakhallah khair.